the weirdest thing of all is people like Sam Altman saying this this could actually be a bubble. Um, if if everyone is talking about it like it's a bubble and everyone thinks it's a bubble, why is everyone continuing to act like it isn't? And why is the uh, is the pace of investment not slowing? The big thing here is this might not be a normal market and this might not be a normal victory. This might be a bubble, but also a race. If, as the people at the top of these labs keep saying they believe, the first company to build powerful AI, in the words of Anthropics founder, uh, AGI, in the words of most of the rest of the industry, artificial general intelligence, human level intelligence. If the first lab to build that owns the future, perhaps in a science fictionally literal sense, then it's quite hard to value that. And potentially, you know, I've seen one figure, just one, on the valuation of building AGI or superintelligence of $1.46 quadrillion. Well, hang on. This is the idea, though, that one company wins. And surely the um, the history of the industry for the last couple of years is that, what you know, who's in front changes all the time. They're all kind of neck and neck. Now, I can see that that means that you then don't want to drop out of the race if you think that whoever wins, whatever that means, kind of gets a monopoly of AI. But isn't it much more likely that we don't get a, a, a monopoly outcome? Going back to telecoms, I remember George Gilder, who was a great sort of guru of, of telecoms investment at the time. And he said that Global Crossing and 360 networks were, were fighting for supremacy and control of the <laughs> internet. And it was going to, you know, one or other of them was going to win in the year 2001, I think it was. I mean, you know, and no one remembers these companies yeah, now, right? Yeah. Why do people think this is a winner-takes-all market? Because people think that we might develop something that we can call superintelligence. And if we do, everything gets a bit weird. The definition of superintelligence is a, an artificial intelligence that is smarter than any human ever has been. That and, includes, it's sort of, and it's self-improving, so it kind of takes off. Exactly, because that includes every single AI developer that ever has been. What happens if you get there or if you get close, in theory, is that the first company to have this system immediately develops the second superintelligent AI. It's very hard to judge the value of the market as a whole, because if you think this is vanishingly unlikely to happen, let's say you think there's a one in a thousand chance of OpenAI becoming a $1.46 quadrillion company. Well, one in a thousand is still one uh, 146 billion. Is right. It? But even if you think, even if you think that um, it's a 5% chance of doing this, I can see if you're backing one of these companies, it's like a 5% chance to maybe control the, the, you know, the world of technology. But also it means you are saying, yes, I assume I'm going to lose all yeah. the money I invest in this. And that's one way that you can end up with this bubble where you're buying not an investment, but a lottery ticket. Right. And, you and you know you're buying a lottery ticket. It's definitely the case that we are reaching the stage as we did you know, most recently with the crypto boom beforehand, where you can sprinkle AI dust on an unimpressive company and people will start shoveling money through your letterbox to get a stake in it. That, that part of the AI boom is happening right. and a, a bust will come. I think the the important question, though, is whether or not we see a bust that leaves just ashes after it, as I think we sort of did with the crypto boom, or a bust that leaves, well, I mean, well, yeah, railway exactly. tracks. Railway tracks, that's always the example I think of. And I, th I think of it particularly, I came to the office today on, so I commute from southeast London, and I happened to come along the oldest commuter railway in London. And it was built in the 1830s. And, um, and it goes from Greenwich to London Bridge. And that's the railway I came along. And they built essentially the whole railway on elevated brick arches. And those brick arches are still there. They used 60 million bricks to build them. The company that built it, as I say, it's probably listed in here, but it's you know it's long gone. But those bricks are still there and are still useful. I'm sure they've upgraded the tracks a few times. But the point is, there was useful physical infrastructure mm. left behind. There was again with the electricity boom, they built lots of grids and lots of power stations. And you know, if the companies that invested them and the companies that first built them went bust, well, we still got to use them. And then most famously with the the fibre of the telecoms boom, um, that all got put in the ground. Companies went bust, but then eventually it, it got lit up, and we're probably talking to people through some of that fibre. Mm right now what's left behind though with with ai because those those data centers full of chips i mean those chips go out of date quite quickly don't they they're yeah. quite they're obsolete quite fast here is a here is a massive one so is that what's left behind is is that something you can still use i mean i mean firstly i love thematically you came to work on the oldest commuter rail i came to work in britain's newest i, I commute on the elizabeth line on crossrail so hooray it's definitely the case that this stuff will get left behind right this this the physical concrete that is being poured to back up the ai industry is enormous 
those data centers have limited use if they're not being used so for what AI fraction of the cost of uh, building one of these things is going on chips and how much of it is on my it? incredibly rough ball mark is about 50 percent of right. this compute the chips are extremely expensive concrete isn't and you can you use those ai chips for you know for web serving and things like I that i mean this was my hope right but mm, not not really, not really. so for connect, instance but... although gpus the the nvidia chips that we're all talking about uh have their roots in computer gaming you can't take an ai data center flick a switch and have it being a streaming games console for people around the world because you've got hundreds of thousands of GPUs and you don't have the CPUs. Oh, they're all just connected around. straight to each other. Exactly. Yeah. So they're built to do AI and you can't really use them for other things. Now, there are AI and AI-esque use cases that are outside of anything we're talking about today. If you're in the world of weather modeling or huge amounts of financial trading and that you sort of complex modeling, to. you're going to be able to repurpose this. And, you know, worst case scenario for those industries, AI bubble collapses and they get a few years of just really, really, really cheap, cheap compute. compute. Okay. Right. Well, I think then the, the other thing that people say is left over is the idea that it's actually the models themselves and the kind of the expertise of, of the models. This sounds a bit kind of ethereal to me um it's like a it's all right these are th this sort of you know intangible uh <laughs> software expertise has been left behind and you know and the investors who've said we paid six trillion dollars for this um but the other weird thing about it is and you didn't get this with the railways you've got those uh those commercial models that all of this investment has helped to to fund and to trade and to operate but you've also got open source or open weight ai models that in some cases are pretty good you didn't have open source railways so what concerns me is that if if the investors are hoping to get their money back because you know eventually consumers and companies are going to be paying lots of money to use these AI systems, money that they're not paying yet, but that they, they will in the future. Why would they pay lots of money for those expensive commercial models if the if the uh, the open source models are there too. So isn't that also quite a big difference from from previous uh, previous situations? Yeah, I mean, you've hit one of the trillion dollar questions of this whole thing, right? It's very clear to me that AI is, is going to change the world in some quite substantial way. It's not clear who's going to capture the value. And it's not clear that anyone making AI is going to capture that value at all. If an open source model created by a company like Meta, who released their Llama series open source, or one of the Chinese giants like Alibaba, who released their Quen series, or DeepSeek, who released their mm. eponymous DeepSeeks, uh, if those models are good enough, and that might not need to be that close to the absolute top tier, then we could end up with a world where Almost every industry is transformed by AI and they don't pay anyone for it. Yeah.